have not been with us. You should have a I don't even have a copy of it anymore because I keep giving mine away. Um, let me grab one. I'm sorry, I have to keep right for your sake. I'm sorry, sorry. It's snug as on the spot back here. Okay, you should have a piece of paper that looks like this, but the text on it is kind of wrong-ish. It's kind of right and kind of wrong. So it's praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below, instead of high and low. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God for all that love has done. Creator Christ, instead of word, and spirit one. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Okay, uh, not to be confused with hallelujah. Okay, uh, so there's that. Or, or hallelujah. Um, okay, so there's that. We do the prayer of dedication. They'll do announcements. Lord only knows how long it'll be. And then be now my vision. This is my favorite. Okay. Uh, just try to wake your sleep right there. But uh, the last one. One, two, three. We are doing all four verses, and they're all in unison. <laughs> Check, check, And we want her to go do that. We, like, that's awesome. We check. want her to play mom. Mom. So, um, check, 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 it's check, check, one of the best options check. in the world. If you've never seen it, check. you should make some time to go see it at some point. Um, however, right. Emily Rosette is going here. to be stepping in for Alice that weekend. 
Um, if you're not familiar with We're Emily, if Emily just that random blonde lady who's singing, sing, singing, singing soprano tunes, just be aware she was Glenda on Check, Mother's check, check. So like, she got the pipe. Right, uh, she just, she didn't sing with us last year because she was too busy, and now she, she was Glenda and Wicked on Broadway. Yeah, so she got the pipe. She's gonna join you as the Allison section leader for that evening, and then Allison will be back with us on Sunday morning. Okay. Is that leaving us alone? No, you got him. Yeah, I almost yes. called someone else, but uh, Michaela almost called Michaela, and then it felt like we were pushing along. So we're just going to let Emily do it. And Emily's incredible. So she's already learned it. She called, so we figured this check, out. Check, check, right. check. A one, two she test. Go, right? All right. Yeah. She's still going to be with us through the whole rehearsal process because she's doing it Sunday morning. So she will still be leading sectional and stuff. Just know that she... Section leader will not be here, but you will have a replacement ringer of sorts to make people more confident. Is it okay? We're okay, great. All right, okay. cool.
Well, yeah, no, get settled in, and then I'll just put this to the mic for you.
Um, now you're funny. Testing. One, two, three. Okay. Good morning. Um, I mean, you're Pretty six good. and eight, so it's not like okay. anything. You yeah. receive receipts. Yeah. Okay. I All checked right. them before, so. I'm not you check them again, you should be good. Thank you. Pretty loud and clear. Actually, very loud. I'm gonna keep talking for a minute. Yeah, we're good.
Good morning. Welcome to Union Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Whether this is your first or 500th time here, whether you are with us on the live stream or here in person, whether you are gay or straight, whether you are full this morning of belief or of doubt, sorrow or joy. We gather in this place not because God is here and not out there, but because we together set aside our time and attention to notice that God is with us, and to be transformed by the presence of God in community. So welcome. Let us be present here together. Bring your breath. Bring all that is on your heart. Bring your questions. Bring your worry. And let us set it here before God. Will you please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet God provides for the basic sustenance of life. May our hearts be open to trust you. Look at the birds of the air. They neither study nor plan nor plot their course. And yet God writes the instinct for migration on their hearts. May our eyes be open to see you. Look at the birds of the air. They neither talk, nor vote, nor debate their responsibility, and yet God weaves them into communities which nurture and defend. May our hands be open to serve you. Let us sing together. Forgive us for being timid when you empower us, for being resigned when you have created us to be resolute, for being complicit 
when you have charged us to be transformative. Help us to walk in your image and your path of righteousness, courageousness, and loving kindness. Amen. Beloved friends, remember that we do not walk this journey alone. The comforter and advocate accompanies us and equips us for the ministries of abundant love that show up, speak up, and act up in the name of Jesus. Know that our lives and our witness make a difference in this world. God is faithful to forgive and enables us to do the impossible and be the unimaginable. And as people who can claim that forgiveness and that grace received from our God, let us share that with each other. The grace and the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us share that peace. <laughs> I think I finally had the, the button open. Good morning. Good morning. From the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and corruption consume and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor corruption consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. The light on the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is without guile, the whole of your body will be illumined. But if your eye is wicked, the whole of your body will be gloomy. If then the light in you is bleak, how great is the gloominess. No one can serve two masters, for a person will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason, I tell you all, be not anxious about your life, what you all will eat, or what you all will drink, or about your body, what you all will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly provider feeds them. Are you all not of more significance than they? How then can any of you by being anxious, add to your span of life by a single hour. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. If there are any children here this morning, I invite you to come join me on the chancel steps. And if maybe you're like a little older than a child, but might be willing to come hang out with me, I would love your company too. Because I think we're, we're a little few and far between this morning. I see a few coming up. Thanks, Catherine and Morgan and Walter. Good morning. How are you guys? Thanks, Pastor Ron. Here we go. John David. I knew I had some friends. So, Susan, thank you. Annalise. So, these, these grown-ups know a really good secret, which maybe um, we can let everyone else in on. I'm going to read a, a book this morning, or at least part of it. Did you know that grown-ups are allowed to read children's books? Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it's kind of a great thing to do. 
So um, we heard some scripture this morning. And, and it has the best picture on it. Yeah, so it won an, this book won an award for best pictures. Um, it's called, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But so we heard this scripture this morning, um, and it was about not worrying and about not storing up things that we could, we could share. So um, I, when I read this, this scripture, I thought of this picture book, which is one of my favorites. It's called Thank You, Amu. And yes, it is a Caldecott honor and a Coretta Scott King Award winner. So if that's not uh, incentive. So it's called Thank You, Amu. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to read parts of it. On the corner of First Street and Long Street, on the very top floor, Amu was cooking a thick red stew in a big fat pot for a nice evening meal. She seasoned it and stirred it and took a small taste. What a delicious stew, Amu said. Tonight's dinner will surely be the best I ever had. With that, Amu put down her spoon and went to read a book before supper. As the thick red stew simmered on the stove, its scrumptious scent wafted out the window and out the door, down the hall toward the street, and around the block until someone was at the door. When Amu opened it, she saw a little boy. Little boy, Amu exclaimed, what brings you to my house? I was playing with my race car down the hall when I smelled the most delicious smell, the little boy replied. What is it? Thick red stew. Mmm, stew, he sighed. That sure sounds yummy. Amu thought for a moment. She was saving her stew for dinner, but she had made quite a bit. It would not hurt to share. Would you like some? The little boy nodded. And so Amu spooned out some thick red stew from the big pat, fat pot for her nice evening meal. Thank you, Amu, the little boy said, and went on his way. So here's where I'm going to skip a little bit. So as it goes on, the, the smell of the stew keeps wafting out the door and down the hall, around the block, until someone else knocks at the door. This time it's Miss Police Officer. What do you think Amu does for the police officer? Yeah, Morgan. She does. She shares her stew again. And Miss Police Officer says, thank you, Amu. And the police officer leaves, and the smell keeps wafting out. And sure enough, a few minutes later, someone knocks again, and this time, it's Mr. Hot Dog Vendor. And what do you think Amu does for the hot dog vendor? She gives yeah, she gives him some stew, too. And the hot dog vendor says thank you and goes on his way. And throughout the day, people from all across the neighborhood knocked on Amu's door. She fed a shop owner, a cab driver, a doctor, an actor, a lawyer, a dancer, a baker, an artist, a singer, an athlete, a bus driver, a construction worker, and even the mayor stopped by. <gasps> and each time they knocked, Amu shared. Soon the sky darkened, the street lights brightened, and it was finally time for dinner. But when Amu opened her big fat pot of thick red stew for her nice evening meal, What's in there, Catherine? It was empty. It was empty. Amu sniffled. There goes the best dinner I ever had. Sorry in blue, she sat at the table with her empty pot until, sound effects please. <laughs> Who could that be, Amu wondered. When she opened her door, she saw, the little boy, the police officer, the hot dog vendor, the shop owner, the cab driver, the doctor, the actor, the lawyer, the dancer, the baker, why everyone she fed today was at her door. I'm sorry, everyone, Amu sighed. My thick red stew is all gone. I have nothing left to share. The little boy tugged at Amu's sleeve. Don't worry, Amu. We're not here to ask. We are here to give. The police officer carried in a fresh salad. The mayor entered with a roast chicken. The baker brought a collection of sweet goodies. Even the little boy presented Amu with something special in a shiny red envelope. Everyone who had knocked on Amu's door that day squeezed inside her tiny apartment, and together they ate, danced, and celebrated. 
with Amu's big fat pot of thick red stew was empty, her heart was full of happiness and love. That dinner was the best she had ever had. Thank you, Amu. It's a pretty good book, don't you think? What do you think that book, what is that story about? Yeah, Morgan. When you give your cup, you're going to get something back for your kindness. Yeah, well, sometimes when we share, we get even more in return than we gave in the first place. Yeah. What else? Anything else? Grown-ups can say anything, too. <laughs> Being together. Being together that matters. Treat yeah. how you want to be treated. Treat people how you want to be treated. Yeah, if, if you want other people to share with you, you should share with them. Yeah. So... I love this book because it reminds us that sometimes we can worry about, will I have enough? Is that stew going to last me for dinner tonight and for leftovers tomorrow? But when we choose to be generous and to share with our neighbors, God has a way of making sure that there is more than enough for everyone. Will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God. thank you for giving us more than enough. Thank, Thank you, you for giving us more than enough. Remind us to share. Remind us to share. Thank you for all we have been given. Thank you for all we have been given. Amen. All right, you all can return to your seats or make your way towards learning centers where Anthony is going to lead you back there. Thanks for reading the book with me.
Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, our liberator, and our redeemer. Amen. Anxiety is the thief of joy. I should know. Like at least one in five American adults and significantly more adult women, I struggle with anxiety. I didn't really know this consciously for a long time. But looking back, I see it. My perfectionism, my inability to sleep in, even as a 21-year-old young adult. What 22-year-old do you know who can't sleep past eight? There were other clues, too. And I should start by saying that there is help for anxiety. Mental health professionals, medication, and lots of other ways of supporting you, too, if you struggle. Today's reading is not about clinical anxiety. It's more about worry. Less about social anxiety and more about societal anxiety. Which is a good thing because, quite frankly, Jesus has lots of helpful advice, but be not anxious is about the least helpful thing you can say to someone <laughs> with anxiety. Today's reading challenges us to reckon with the societal and personal worries that plague us. It reminds us that anxiety is the thief of joy. Psychology Today begins their explanation of anxiety by saying that the true cause of anxiety is being a human being, gifted with the capacity to imagine a future. Yikes. When I was doing my clinical pastoral education at Jewish Theological Seminary, my supervisor taught us that anxiety has several manifestations. There's physical anxiety, those feelings in our body, queasy stomach, tapping toes or fingers, tight shoulders that signal to us that something is wrong. And then there's also the negative predictions, where we anticipate a negative outcome about the future. She often reminded us, can you predict the future? And it sometimes was really hard to admit, no, I cannot predict the future. <laughs> but I really think I know. It's this capacity to imagine the future and to worry about the future that can inspire us and offer hope, but also to trap us in our worry. We as humans can imagine a future, but when we rely on our own vision, we lack both the trust in God and the hope that God provides. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to his disciples about the challenge of living in the world without succumbing to its ways. And I don't think Jesus was ignorant to the fact that then, just as now, there are plenty of people, too many people, who do not have all they need. Jesus has been in and among people who were struggling to get by, subjects of Roman occupation, sick and hungry because of the inequality of the system that they lived in. Jesus was not telling people to not worry about starving, nor letting others off the hook to not be concerned with their hungry neighbors. Rather, Jesus was casting a vision of a world in which those with enough would release their tight grip, and that society as a whole might distribute the abundance that God has provided. Now, this is embarrassing, but one of my worst habits, manifestations of my anxiety, is online shopping. <laughs> I said it was embarrassing, but each click in the virtual shopping cart gives me that false sense of control. If I can just prepare for the coming season or solve some inane household inconvenience with this miraculous product, maybe I'll feel better. And I do for a minute. Until the next night, sitting on the couch, when I need to see what else it is that I don't know that I need. 
It's this same reaction to anxiety that has led to a society in which scarcity is both perceived and real. It's perceived by almost all of us and by society as a whole that we will not have enough because in fact we have eroded the social contract to the point where most people don't have enough. Not enough to afford housing in this area, to pay for college without crushing debt, to retire comfortably, and for many, not enough to put food on the table. It is not a personal failing to have experienced any of that, nor is it Jesus' ad admonition to not worry the antidote to it. But on the social scale, at the level of us as a collective, trust is the antidote. Anxiety about the future, again, not in a clinical sense, but in a spiritual one, is the thief not just of joy, but of faith. When we cling to our resources out of fear, even when we think we are being practical and wise, it gets in the way of our trust in God. Throughout the scriptures, God teaches this lesson to God's people. God shows the Israelites in the wilderness that she will provide manna every day. But if they try to squirrel it away for tomorrow, the abundance will cease. Jesus, over and over, shows what trust in God looks like. It looks like feeding 5,000 with only a few loaves and fishes. It looks like disciples being sent out with no cloak or belt, indeed leaving everything behind. And today, we hear that Jesus teaches that when we hoard, when we act out of fear for the future, our hearts betray us and become more concerned with anxiety over scarcity than our trust in the God of abundance. No one can serve two lords or masters, for a person will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. We Christians love to try to squirrel our way around that passage, justifying ourselves and our infatuation with the illusion of security. When Jesus is clear, you cannot serve God and wealth. Indeed, we cannot add a single hour to our span of life with our worry, and yet we worry. Medical research shows that, in fact, we probably shorten our lives with all that worry, and yet we are human after all. Armando sent around to the generosity team an obituary a week or two ago of Charles Feeney. Mr. Feeney died at the age of 92. After being perhaps the only billionaire to have ever given away his entire fortune before the end of his life. Eight billion dollars he gave away. You might look up this obituary because it is quite something, his story. He's not a household name, unlike Bill Gates and Warren Buffett or others. His name appeared on none of the thousand buildings on five continents that he gave $2.7 billion to fund. He lived in a simple, rented, two-bedroom apartment. Now, regardless of what you think of whether we as a society should allow any individual to accumulate so much in the first place, Mr. Feeney was out of the ordinary. When asked why he chose to give it all away, he said that he was beginning to have doubts about his right to have so much money. How much is rich, he said beyond all expectations, beyond all deserving, so to speak. I just reached the conclusion with myself that money, buying boats, and all the trimmings didn't appeal to me. So Mr. Feeney reversed his extravagant lifestyle, quit wealthy social groups, started flying economy, buying his clothing off the rack, and giving up fancy restaurants. He sold his limousines and took subways or cabs. And he resolved to give his money away anonymously a course followed by only 1% of American givers. It's easy, of course, to give a lot when you have a lot. 
but Mr. Feeney is nonetheless an inspiration and an example. Not because of how much he gave, but because of his honesty about the lack of satisfaction it provides to accumulate beyond our immediate needs and how much more satisfying and soul-mending it is to be liberated from our greed. I cannot think of a more personally rewarding and appropriate use of wealth than to give while one is living, to personally devote oneself to meaningful efforts to improve the human condition, he said. So as we enter the season of church life where we reflect and pray on our own giving habits and invitation to generosity, May we be afflicted by Jesus' words and inspired by Feeney's example. You will each be asked to discern your gifts to the church in the coming year as we approach stewardship or what we're now calling Commitment Sunday on November 19th. We know that generosity is not measured only in dollars, nor is the church the only place where we are called to be generous financially. As individuals and as a congregation, we are invited to wrestle with where anxiety gets in the way of trusting God and how generosity may be a spiritual tool that allows us to embody and strengthen our faith and our trust in God. May we as a congregation make decisions together about our collective resources that are not based in fear for the future, but trust in God's providence and call to love our neighbors today. May we all take one step closer to a day where our treasure truly is what is in our hearts. May it be so. Amen. Please be seated. We gather now in a time of prayer to remember those whose concerns are on our hearts and minds. And we share joys and concerns with each other. We begin with celebrating the birth of Leo grandson, new grandson, to Michelle and Paul Sionis. 
We also pray for Willa, friend of Isabel Genest, who is nearing the end of her life in hospice care. We remember the Reverend Cindy Reynolds and the Reverend Bob Castles, Dawn Ermler Fisher, the Hellman family, Joy Mishkin, and Lindsay Tremblack. Are there other joys or concerns that you wish to add? Yes. We thank you and remember with We know nothing. You know, I, 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 my family founded this church and the church in Cleveland for 1924, okay? And I, last year, I pulled up the public and I'm not going to be pulled up again. And you can look at the thing on my t-shirt and you can see. God, in your mercy, we, we hear your no, prayers, I Nancy. Don't hear your, I don't want to hear from you. In humility, we grieve you Eric, want to see? we grieve like Jimmy, you, and I invite you to, to pray with me. No, I'm not praying. Gracious God, in your mercy, provide help and grant peace to her troubled soul and help all of us to be present with those who carry those troubles with them in their heart and minds throughout their lives. Are there other joys and concerns. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kayla. Um, I would just like to share a concern. A friend of mine, Patrick, his mom passed um, like two weeks ago, and she had been slowly declining for a while, but it's still really hard for him. Mm -hmm. um, and he was trying to find a pastor to do his service, and it was taking a while. I think he found someone, but anyway, they're just trying to celebrate 
we remember Patrick and the loss of his mom. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Did you have a prayer? For Mark as he undergoes surgery and that his spirit may continue to be carried by our God and by each other. Sorry, Chris. We're glad to see the family, the Bailey family here in the pews on Sunday morning. As a whole, yes, Mike. I'll share a joy that uh, and Gigi Thor, the uh, couple that from Afghanistan that you've been helping uh, kids get their green card for a couple of years. Well, that is a celebration. <laughs> and the last time I was in this sanctuary, I had to leave early because my mom was rushed to the hospital. And I have joy that she has stabilized and she is back in the facility where she's living. Uh, her prognosis is not that great, but um, she is still with us. So both in mind as well as body. So for that, we are grateful. Are there any other, yes, Janet. Janet prays with us all for the Middle East and the trouble going on. If there are no other prayers, let us be in an attitude of prayer. Holy and gracious God, with gratitude for all your goodness and confidence in your abiding presence among us, we come to you in prayer for our families, friends, and neighbors for our siblings in faith, and for the world of nations you have made. We pray for all leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ. Only wise God, guide them. We especially remember this morning our newly installed President and General Minister of the United Church of Christ, the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson. Inspire all our Church's leaders, O oh God, with insight that their actions may encourage the faithful and build up the life and mission of your church. Let us pray for those who govern us. Eternal ruler of the universe, we pray for those who govern every nation and for the peoples that they lead. We ask that you look with grace upon our president and all other elected officials who shape our lives. Turn their hearts to you, that your ways of truth, justice, peace, and shalom might be given a chance to reign on this earth. We pray for those who are homeless, hungry, or victims of war, violence, and natural disaster. Gracious God, you suffer with those who suffer. We pray for those who lack what they need to live and those whose lives have been shattered by terrorism, war, and disaster. We pray for our neighbors in Israel and in Gaza, in Yemen and in the Ukraine, in South Sudan, in Somalia, in Niger, and all the other troubled countries of this world. We remember those killed and injured as they sought shelter in the Orthodox Church of St. Porphyrius. We pray for your work of restoring life through the care of faithful people and the cessation of hostilities 
in this war-weary world. We pray for the sick and the grieving. Holy Comforter, lay your healing hand on all who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, and all who grieve. We especially remember those whose names we have lifted before you this morning and those who have remained private in the secret in our hearts. Radiate through their lives with the light of your presence that renewed health and strength may be theirs. And finally, we pray for ourselves, God of hope and new life. Open our hearts to the joy and abundant life you intend for us. Grant us your peace, which is not the absence of trouble, but the awareness of your life-giving presence in all that we do. All this we pray, O God, and all our petitions we bring before you as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us when he taught us to pray, saying, our creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned in my sermon, we are uh, in the beginning of our season of generosity leading up to Commitment Sunday on November 19th. And as part of the tradition of this church, the generosity team has invited a few people to speak uh, this week and the next couple weeks as testimonials of how this church changes lives and how the practice of generosity has changed their own. So this morning, I invite Kayla Jackson to come and share. Good morning. Uh, so I was asked to share a little bit about why I give or why it's important to me. Um, and before I share, just let you know that I wrote this down during the week. It will connect a lot to what Katrina has already said, but I promise that was unintentional. Um, so, just saying. Okay, so I have two important things that I would like to say. Number one, in a lot of churches, the conversation about giving is riddled with guilt. People feel pressure to give, and I know I felt like God will only be happy if I give my 10%. Worse still, I have heard sermons about, regardless of your situation, ensuring you get your tithe in has brought blessings from the Lord. Now, the conversation about giving still lingers with guilt at times, I'll be honest, but it's different from what I actually believe now. The God I believe in now is much more paradoxical than that. While I don't believe that giving will bring blessings as a cause and effect, I do believe that when I give, I am blessed because of a shift in my perspective. I'm reminded when I give of how much I have to be grateful for in what I do have and how I'm blessed to share. So while I don't believe I'm blessed because I give, I do believe I get a blessing through a sense of gratitude when I give. And that shift has been transformative for my faith. Point number two. As Christians, and especially in a church like ours, our mission should be to practice what we preach. Not doing that is what causes people to feel the way they do about Christians. If we preach love of neighbor, we should love neighbor. No one can come to church or pray or do anything if they're hungry. Basic hierarchy of needs says we need our basic needs met. So if our neighbor doesn't have that, we should help them with it when we can. The more extras we have, the more we may be able to give with those basics. That is just what I believe, um, based on what the Bible says. And that's my second point. Um, <laughs> sorry. Thank you for your time. Um, 
And the last thing I'd like to say about this topic is that I hope that you will pray and meditate on what you believe about giving and give according to what you believe and not because of what I say or what anyone says, because I do believe it's an act of faith um, and it's very personal to each of us. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. So you've all heard or read in our emails the last few weeks about how this church is able to support the work of a number of organizations in the community thanks to your generosity. And you'll hear from others like you did from Kayla today over, ne over the next three weeks about how this church also transforms the lives of its members and friends. Because of you, all of that is possible. So you'll be able to give today as the ushers come around with the offering plates. And I also want to highlight that we now have text to give. There are instructions in your bulletin, and you can also give online at unionkong.org. But today, in addition to receiving any financial gifts online or in person, we want to invite you into a time of reflection and ask for the gift of your thoughts. As you may remember, one of our missional priorities this year is around developing a clearer sense of identity so that we can share that with the wider community. And we are a church that is very good at writing pages and pages and pages of visioning statements and paragraphs of purpose, but less so at being really concise and evocative, I, I would say. So our prompt today is for you to write maybe one to three words on the post-it note that should be in your bulletin, and I hope there are enough pens throughout the pews for you to grab something to write with. And I'm gonna give you this prompt. What is union's essence? If Union were a perfume sitting on the shelf at, I don't know what the stores are called where they sell perfume, we would be eau de what? <laughs> I'm being funnier today than I think I intended. Um, so what, <laughs> what is Union's essence is the prompt. Um, we invite you to use this time as the offering is collected to jot down your words and then hold on to them. As you move into the assembly room for the congregational meeting following the service, you can put your post-it note on the um, bulletin board or the whiteboard just to your left as you enter that room. If you're online, you can put your words in the chat or email them to me. The governing board will collect all of these words and use them to help guide our process of clarifying our sense of identity. With gratitude, the offerings will now be received.
please join me in our prayer of dedication. Generous God, we thank you for the gifts we receive and for the gifts we give. May they serve to make your kingdom come and your will be done. Magnify their impact so that you may be glorified and your name be praised. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements today. I'm going to invite Will to come on up. He's going to make an announcement about the youth group in just a minute. But while you're coming up, and you can use that microphone, I'll say a few things. So we have our congregational meeting. This is the first of our quarterly congregational meetings as part of our new governance structure. After worship today, in the assembly room and also on Zoom, child care will be provided for that. Next Sunday, we will have an intergenerational Halloween event immediately following the service. Um, so first, you are all invited to come in costume or perhaps in the Halloween spirit uh, to worship next Sunday. Um, and we invite you to stay afterward for some games and fun in the assembly room. Patty is looking for three volunteers to help her with that event. So if you would be willing to help um, sort of supervise an activity or otherwise help, um, please see Patty or send her an email after the service. Um, the confirmation class, I should say, next Sunday, um, led by me, will be at Bethany Baptist Church worshiping as part of our field trips this fall. So I will not be here this Sunday. I should say the confirmation class was at Temple Nair to Mead on Friday night, so we are um, in our uh, season of field trips, which has been really enriching. Why don't I turn it over to you, Will, to talk about the youth group? Uh, please join the Ecumenical Youth Ministry Project and the Five Church Food Drive, calling all dry and canned foods through October 29th, which is next Sunday. Additionally, next Sunday will also be the autumn day of service for middle school and high school students here at Union Kong from 4 to 6. Um, please come rain or shine. And for additional information, or if you're an adult that is interested in volunteering, please look in the bulletin or contact Christina at youthminister.christina at gmail.com. Thank you, Will. So uh, food drive for, for next Sunday, if you can bring some canned goods to help support the youth in their food drive. And then they will be gathering across the street at the gardens from 4 to 6 next Sunday. Uh, this week, the America's Unholy Ghost series will continue on Thursday at 7 o'clock. Even if you missed the first session last week, you are welcome and invited to join in. And then in two weeks, um, on November 5th, we will have a busy Sunday. I wanted to highlight a few things happening. Um, after worship, there will be an all-church work day, focusing on cleaning out a lot of the items that are in the church. So it'll be an inside work day, not an outside work day. And um, activities and, and tasks uh, for all abilities. So you can come in casual clothes, bring a pair of work gloves if you have them. Um, and they will assign tasks after the service. Um, if you worship with us online, also that Sunday, we will have a Zoom coffee hour that day. The intent is that we'll do a Zoom coffee hour the first Sunday of every month. Uh, we were interrupted last, last month, but uh, we hope this is the first of our regular first Sunday Zoom coffee hours going forward. And then we will also, on the 5th, have an inquirer session. So this is a conversation open to anyone who is newer to the community or curious about what membership means here. Uh, to join me and members of the welcoming team in a conversation uh, to ask questions and learn more about us. There is a lot going on. As always, the best way to find out about everything that is happening is to check your Thursday email. Will you please stand and join us in our closing hymn?
because there is much to worry about. But Jesus calls us to radically trust in God, to radically trust in God's community. May we be challenged by these words and inspired by the examples of generosity all around us. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God be good to you and grant you peace. Amen. Thank you.